The evidence-based treatment for OCD is what's known as exposure and response prevention therapy. And exposure and response prevention therapy is a face your fears model. And basically what it does is it helps the patient expose themselves to situations that trigger intrusive thoughts. And then they have to practice resisting ritualizing. And so one way to think about this is the more you expose yourself to situations that make you feel uncomfortable, the easier it becomes over time. And so when we do exposure therapy, we first start by developing what's known as an avoidance hierarchy. An avoidance hierarchy is a list of situations that trigger obsessions and the urge to engage in compulsions. And then we rank order them using a SUD scale. And a SUD scale stands for subjective units of discomfort or distress. And a SUD scale is just like a pain scale. If you've ever been to the doctor and you haven't been feeling well and you're in a great deal of pain, they usually show you the scale from zero to 10. And they ask you, how much pain are you in from zero to 10? Zero meaning no pain at all, 10 the most pain you've ever experienced. The same is true when we're treating OCD. We get a list, a comprehensive list of all of the different obsessions experienced, all of the compulsions engaged in, and then we come up with a hierarchy of all the situations that trigger those obsessions and compulsions. And then we rank order them from most anxiety provoking to least anxiety provoking using this SUD scale. And the SUD scale essentially says, how much anxiety or distress are you in from zero to 10? So if I were to have you go and touch this door handle and resist washing your hands and notice this thought that you're going to get sick and die, how uncomfortable would you feel from zero to 10? Okay, zero, no anxiety or discomfort at all. 10, the most you've ever experienced. Think like panic attack level distress. And what most people will say is there usually are ranges. And so there's some things that are mildly anxiety provoking that they still avoid. That would be maybe a three or a five. And then there's other things that fall in kind of that seven to eight range that are a little bit more distressing and they're more avoidant of. And once we get a list of all of those situations and we've ranked them, then we put them in order. And we start to pick certain situations to expose themselves to. And so when we're thinking about contamination, I think it's a really clear cut one because what you do is you essentially come up with a list of all of the items at home or at school or at work that are contaminated that you either avoid touching, after touching you feel the need to wash your hands, or you use a barrier to prevent contact from contaminants, such as say your sleeve on your shirt when you're opening a door or using your foot to flush the toilet when going to the bathroom. And then what we say is, okay, great. This is what we're gonna do, okay? We're gonna come up with an exposure of you picking one of these items on your list that's contaminated and intentionally touching them. And we're gonna keep your hand in contact with that contaminant for a duration of 30 minutes. And as your hands touching that object, I don't want you to distract. I don't want you to reassure yourself that nothing bad's gonna happen. I just want you to notice everything that's showing up for you. Where do you feel that anxiety in your body? Do you notice is your heart beating? You know, a lot of people with contamination, they say, I actually feel it transferring. I feel this like tingling sensation in my hand. I go, great, good noticing. Keep holding that door handle. You're doing an awesome job. And then we ask them to check in to notice what are the obsessions they're experiencing? You know, and these, these individuals will say, I'm noticing the thought that I'm going to get sick. I'm noticing my hand feels really dirty and gross. Like I, I really, and I'm noticing that urge to wash right now. Awesome. Good noticing. And all we're doing is helping create them space for them to allow themselves to experience those physical sensations, allow themselves to have that thought. And then we have them resist acting on that urge to wash their hands. And the more they do this, the easier it is to do. And, and so there's kind of this confusing aspect to treatment, right? Where sometimes people experience what's known as habituation. And habituation is when your anxiety starts to climb, you don't engage in the compulsion, and it starts to come down all on its own. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes over time, okay? Until you can go into that situation and it feels uncomfortable, but it doesn't 
get worse than that. It just feels mildly uncomfortable and you can tolerate it. Okay. But for some people, you know, their anxiety doesn't necessarily go down per se. Um, and so, but they're better able to flexibly engage in the behaviors they want to, meaning they're able to open that door handle without having to have someone do it for them or without having to wash their hand. And so uh, I think a good way to maybe think about habituation is if you've ever been into a hot tub or jumped into a really cold pool. And so, you know, if you've ever been in a hot tub, what happens when you first get in? It feels really hot, right? And there's this urge to just get out. You don't even want to stay in. And what happens the longer you stay in the water? You know, most people will say, well, it feels less hot. And, and that's interesting because did the temperature of the water actually change? No, right? But your body adjusted to it. It got used to it. And that's the same with anxiety, right? And so whenever we feel anxious, particularly people with OCD, they, want to, they feel the strong urge to perform a behavior to get rid of this discomfort. But if they don't do it, right, their thoughts of worry usually are the anxiety is going to last forever, it's never going to go away, or something terrible is going to happen. But imagine you do the opposite of what OCD tells you. You expose yourself to these anxiety-provoking situations again and again and again, and nothing bad happens. And then all of a sudden it gets easier, right? And so sometimes we use components of ask, like, well, why, why, why would I want to touch something that's dirty? Right? That's a question we get. And nobody wants to touch something that's dirty. And so it's not wanting. It's, are you willing to tolerate the dis this discomfort and distress? Are you willing to feel gross? Are you willing to feel dirty in order to be able to do what you want? And almost everyone you ask that question to will say, yes, 100%. And so an analogy I might use is, you know, imagine someone you really care about um, is outside of the room and your door is closed and they fall and they're calling out for you for help because they broke their leg and you can't open that door because it's contaminated. Are you willing to get dirty? Are you willing to touch that door handle and risk getting sick in order to help that person you care so much about? Of course you are. And that's what we're building. So exposure therapy helps you become resilient. It helps you do things that are challenging, that are scary, and learn that what you're afraid is going to happen is highly unlikely, or when it does, that you can handle it. And great, you got this. And so the whole point of exposure therapy is to be able to win your life back. It's not to have to follow and listen to this dictator called OCD and do whatever it tells you. And so the more you do this, the easier it gets. So again, remember that hierarchy ladder. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. And the more you do that, the easier it becomes. And then those things that used to bother you no longer bother you again in the future.